right. So, um, so we'll go ahead and start. We're going to use, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to use verse uh, nine as our motivation today. So you can read it or just listen as you like. So from 37 practices of a bodhisattva, it says, like dew on the tip of a blade of grass, pleasures of the three worlds last only for a while and then vanish. Aspire to the never changing supreme state of liberation. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. Thinking about the way understanding impermanence leads us to renunciation. Okay, so um, we'll again start with um, trying to connect with the bodhicitta motivation for the six perfections, making sure that they're never separate. Um, and so on page two of your text, um, the verses, <clears throat> on um, verse nine that we just did, this is now moving to the path of beings um, of medium capacity. So in the Lam Rim. Um, the previous verse that we did on Wednesday was um, for beings of lower capacity or lower scope. And now we're into medium capacity or middling scope, meaning that the goal has shifted. So in the small scope, the goal was for um, attaining a positive future life. Now we're looking at getting out of samsara altogether. And then after in the Mahayana path or in the um, great vehicle, that's where you have beings of the great scope and that's where we want to become fully enlightened buddhas for the benefit of all sentient beings so you can't have the bodhicitta motivation without connecting with the previous seemingly lower motivations they all are building blocks that rely on one another and so this is really looking at just your nice classic teaching on impermanence there are so many reasons to look at impermanence but here you're looking at impermanence in order to generate renunciation or the determination to be free from samsara. So you could look at impermanence and say, because everything's impermanent, I need to enjoy what is good and not worry what is bad, right? You could just use the fact of impermanence as uh, ingredients for those thoughts. Um, you could use the fact of impermanence to show you that um, there's no sense in getting attached to what is pleasurable because it will finish. There's no sense in having aversion to what is unpleasant because it will finish. You know, that's normally how we talk about impermanence. In this verse, it's talking about the fact that um, anything samsaric, any samsaric happiness that we have is completely ephemeral, right? It's completely transitory and it's not reliable and it's not consistent and there is no stability. And so the only stability that we can have is the stability of having developed our own mind and the reliance that we can have on that. And so we take this moment to really think about knowing impermanence can make me have the determination to be free of cyclic existence because it's built into cyclic existence that things change whether I want them to or not. So that's what this verse is about. Um, does it bring up any thoughts or ideas um, using classic impermanence in this way? It's pretty straightforward, this verse, um, but it's interesting to look at. I think the key, the key here is to look at the fact that most of our planning in samsara is doomed to failure, right? Most of our planning with samsaric things isn't going to come to fruition exactly the way we planned it. Of course, it might be much better might be much better. It's not always bad news, but that basically we can never have control over every single condition within samsara. Therefore, we can never predict every single outcome. And that is built into why samsara is something we need to get out of or by uh, habitual 
habitual mental tendencies are something that we need to get rid of the negative ones, develop the positive ones. So that's what this one's about. Um, yeah, thoughts? Clear enough? Arguments? Okay, so um, for your uh, homework, before I forget, does, uh, does everybody have this book by His Holiness now or does um, some of the students not have it yet? So um, His Holiness talks about this verse in this book. And so on page 50, if you just make a mental note to read um, from page 50, if you can read all the way to page 57, that's great. But at least kind of start to skim through the way His Holiness frames these verses. It's going to be useful later when we dig more deeply into the text. Of course, you know, read before and read ahead if you feel like it. But um, that's your homework. So. Um, if you can do that before next Monday, so not before next Wednesday, but before next Monday. So if you want to turn to that outline that we've been looking at for the last few um, sessions on page 18 of your main text. Yeah, it's after the picture of Lama Tsongkhapa. All right, so we discussed the types of joyous effort and we discussed the first type of laziness, um, the laziness of procrastination, the um, putting off energy, which is avoidance or busyness, um, neglect of your true priorities, that one. Um, so having had time to let it sit, why do you think this is an obstacle to energy? Why do you think procrastination robs you will? Just, you know, from your own experience. Is there a relationship between your fatigue and your burnout and our tendency towards procrastination? Is there a relationship? I, I think there is a direct uh, relationship. The more I postpone things, like the uh, khyanu, the more I get uh, tired. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to fl flesh that out more? How, how does that happen internally? Well, I can say from the other side that uh, when I'm, when I'm uh, uh, active and doing things, I have more en energy than when I'm couch potatoing. Yeah. Do you have that expression in Hebrew like we do in English where it says, if you want something to be done, ask a busy person? Yeah, because if they're already engaged in activities, then um, they're already in the flow of getting things done. And so even though it's a bit unfair to always ask busy people to do things, they're probably going to get the job done because they're already in the flow of that momentum. Um, yeah, but your, your kids then really um, have a problem with that. <laughs> that you always choose. Right. <laughs> I mean, it, do, have you noticed this in your own life, though? If you're on a roll, right, you're on a roll, you've been doing good work that you enjoy, and you've been doing this, and then you've been doing that, then something like the dishes might just get done, right? You just, oh, now I've got to do the dishes, I'll do some dishes, now I need to do this, I'm going to do this. When you're in the flow, those things just kind of get done. When you've completely fallen apart and just kind of collapsed in a heap, then something so small, like doing the dishes, can become like this huge task that feels really hard. Yeah, it can be like, oh God, I have to do the dishes. Whereas when you're kind of busy and in the flow, they just get done and you move on and it's no big deal. Do you know this, this one? There's, there's an energy that it costs us in putting things off. It seems like putting things off is saving energy. That's what the lie of the laziness of procrastination is. Part of the lie that it's telling you is you're saving energy by putting this off. 
whatever this is, you know, the good thing, the spiritual path, the meaningful work, the rich life, putting it off is saving you energy. That's the lie. What's really happening is that you know what you need to be doing. So every time you are about to do what you're, you need to be doing, that's important, that is your priority, this laziness energy pushes it away and puts it off and puts it off. And that very mental energy of putting it off is energy, right? And it wears you out. So it's like, it's actually taking more energy to block what you need to be doing than to just get on with it. And yet the lie says you're saving time by waiting or you're saving energy by waiting. Yeah. So these are all these types of laziness are all obstacles to energy or energy suckers or energy killers or ways to stifle inspiration or prevent inspiration. Right. These are all things that say I'm helping you relax. I'm helping you recover when actually the opposite is true. So it's not about necessarily the behaviors of these types of laziness, because sometimes the behaviors could be um, skillful means and sometimes the behaviors could be ignorance based. So it's not about the behaviors, right? What it's talking about is the mental energy of blocking, putting off avoidance actually takes a lot of energy and wears you out. Do you, do you think that's true? Does procrastination make you tired? Uh, if I may, uh, of course it makes you tired, but uh, in psycho, if you're looking at, at uh, procrastination in a psychoanalytic point of view, it has nothing to do with laziness, actually. It has some compli other complications that has to do uh, with uh, a lot of, I don't want to now to enter into psychoanalytical material, but it's, it's not laziness, it's something uh, really different in terms of uh, just one uh, possible meaning is that uh, some people need to have some boundary to fill themselves like a deadline so they will wait until deadline is coming and then they're filling themselves you know on the boundary and then they become they might become very efficiency and uh, you know with with good energy but they can't do it you know to the void as if to the void they, so it has other meanings that uh, has to do with uh, the cohesiveness of the of the self and not necessarily laziness in the immediate uh, sense that we give to this word uh, laziness. It's kind of psychological complication. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I remember when I first um, read these, it seemed like an oversimplification, you know, like to just kind of brand it all as laziness. It seemed to be overly simplistic. Um, the laziness that we talk about in the world is the second type, the, the laziness of attachment to other activities. So colloquially, that's the one that is most familiar to us of what we would define as laziness. The first one and the last one in the world or in psychology or in the West, we wouldn't call those laziness, we would call them something else. Um, but in Buddhism, there's kind of like, there's not enough words, right? in English to describe what's being said. This laziness of procrastination, definitely it's underpinned by any number of things, right? The reason why we put something off, um, you know, it's, it's, it can be very complex, right? And it's, you know, built on all sorts of habits, positive and negative habits, um, functional, dysfunctional habits. You know, there's a lot of things that fuel it. But in this teaching, we're not talking so much about what fuels it as its impact. Yeah, so whatever the reasons are for having this behavior, if you can identify the impact, you're more likely to trace your steps backwards and see if you can eliminate the various causes that led you to that behavior. So it's more talking in terms of impact than why, if that makes sense. So that's the framework of this is why do we do this? Why do we do this? Why do we do this? Identify it, really um, figure out what that looks like for you as an individual and in that very identification, because you know this is bodhisattva practice, this is perfection practice, the idea is that you're already pretty good at seeing yourself, of having mindfulness and introspection and self-awareness. So if you take 
a concept intellectually and then you bring it into the scope of your own personal behavior and you just look at when do I do this you already have enough wisdom that says oh and here's why and here's why that's not true or here's why that's dysfunctional so in meditating on it it's like you understand it intellectually then understand it personally and then just hold that understanding what is the impact this has had on my life how has this prevented me from doing the things I really care about and want to do? What has this given me permission to do that I really shouldn't be doing, et cetera, et cetera. And you're just kind of looking at its impact. And then the changes you need to make, I think reveal themselves to you at this stage in our development. Now, if you were to just identify them way in the very beginning stages when you're first studying about these things or before you had such an engaged ability to be introspective and self-aware, it would just be bad news. And you'd be like, yeah, I do that. That's one of any number of bad things I do that's not useful and not helpful. And the Buddhists are quite unfair by not giving me enough reasons why it's only fair that I've come up with these behaviors and why it's only rational and reasonable given my history, why I do these things. And why are they so judgmental? Damn you Buddhists, you know, if we sort of met this early in the path. So, so really look at terms of impact. What does it do to me that I do this? Yeah, because we all have different reasons why we allow it. And some of those reasons might need to continue for a while. Yeah, whether they're functional or dysfunctional, they, it might be too soon to change them. But sort of catching them is going to start giving us more information about what's skillful and unskillful about our habit patterns. It, it's confronting to name anything you do as lazy because of how loaded that word is. Yeah, it's such a loaded word, especially if you're a very busy, very proactive, very efficient person who gets a lot done to, to name anything that you do as lazy immediately brings up the object of negation, right? It immediately brings up the I that is false. You're like, I am not one of those people. I don't do that. Right? And the I is very present, especially if someone said to you, you are lazy, you'd go, I? I am not lazy. That is the I that is to be destroyed, that has never existed, that is the pretender. Right? It's not even, the, it's not the conventional I, it's the superimposed I. Right? That's the, that's the troublemaker, that little, that little bugger. So, feel confronted, it'll be useful later. Um, <laughs> This laziness of attachment to other activities, this is the one that's like classic laziness where you're entertainment focused and like comfort oriented. And not because you need it because you need to rest, but because it's become like the way of life. So again, it's not about the behavior because sometimes, you know, a bit of entertainment, sometimes a bit of comfort orientation is actually a very soothing way to regroup to continue your good work later. Right? So it's not saying you can't be oriented this way. It's saying that if this is the whole orientation of your life. And for a lot of people, and we just have to look if this is us or not, but for a lot of people, they're working hard all week so that they can have a weekend, so that they can engage in all their favorite entertainment things. And that's the whole point of all the work they've done in the week is so that they have the money to relax. Yeah or so that they have the money to um, you know, do all the activities to stimulate themselves, or you're saving up money and saving up money to go on a holiday, right? Then you have the holiday full of expectations and you get tired and now you have to go home and recover from your holiday. And then you work hard for the next holiday. And basically all of life is saving up for a big entertainment, recovering from the entertainment and then crashing saving up for the next entertainment, doing that, recovering from it, crashing, until you finally get to retire, and then you retire, and then you're depressed because you don't have meaningful work anymore. You know, it's quite a classic tale, right? And, you know, I'm sure you guys have had patients that um, think that life will be better after they are retired, and the first six months is fantastic, and then they're totally depressed, right? It's a classic tale. It's a classic tale. So what putting so laziness of attachment to other activities this one it's um it's not exactly the same as procrastination because it's that these inner the energy that gets sucked is the energy of doing the activities and the energy of justifying it 
both. That's the energy sucker, right? So these, um, this laziness of attachment to other activities can be like classic couch potato sitting on the, t you know, watching TV all day, but it also can be, um, you know, excessive investment in adventures and you always need a stimulating adventure and a stimulating concert and a stimulating museum trip and a stimulating this and a stimulating that, um, all of which takes energy and time that then you can't invest back into your true priorities. So it takes energy in that way. It also takes energy in the sense that you have to justify why it's okay for you to do it instead of what your priorities are. And all that energy of justification and rationalization eats up a lot of fuel. So the activity and the justifying of the activity are why these can kind of kill inspiration for the spiritual path or kill inspiration for self-transformation or altruistic activities. I mean, do you agree or do you feel like there's some there's something there that doesn't ring true. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so it's not like having an adventure or going to a concert is innately bad or good. You know, it's not inherently anything either way. It's the late, it's talking about the reason for doing it is an instead of energy, right? Instead of what I actually have organized myself to do or what I think is the most important priority in my life, instead of doing that thing that brings richness and meaning to my life, I'm gonna do something that gives temporary meaning and temporary richness to my life instead of, right? So the instead of energy, um, part of us, you know, we, I don't know, you'd call it your conscience or whatever it is, knows that this isn't the ideal activity for you to be doing right now. And that niggling of guilt and that niggling of, uh, maybe not the best thing to be doing right now, that niggling is making you tired. So that's, that's part of the idea, right? It's very much the motivation. Because of course, you know, you could say, in order to support my friend who's in this concert, in order to enjoy, uh, I don't know, the richness of humanity and their ability to collaborate or blah, 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 music's fun, I'm gonna go, I need a break so I can keep doing my good work. Great, go to a concert, no worries, right? So it's not like, again, exactly as you said, it's not the activity, it's the motivation you're bringing to it. Um, this is why renunciation can get so heavy for us is it feels like it's saying sacrifice happiness. It's not saying sacrifice happiness. It's saying you're choosing a lesser happiness over a deeper, more consistent and lasting happiness when you kind of know better. Yeah, exactly. So, so this, you know, the classic laziness, it's saying, um, as it says in the outline, you're maybe valuing spiritual practice and beneficial work, but you're valuing and pursuing, pursuing being the key word, mundane and worldly activities more, or valuing pursuing mundane worldly activities more. It, it's like your path becomes incidental you know, your path becomes a hobby you do when you feel like it and you have free time rather than the central orientation of your life. And then things like entertainment being secondary or being hobbies or being incidental. All right. So it's, it's shifting the way you prioritize and you want your central hub of life to be, you know, altruism and meaning. Right. And then there's different things that can support that. And there's different ways to relieve, you know, just the fatigue of work that comes. But you know, it's changing what the central orienting factor is in your life, because if it's all about entertainment, it's so ephemeral and 
you know, you can even be in the middle of your amazing holiday thinking this will be a good memory someday, you know, and it's like you're missing the whole point of life. Yeah. Um, so that's the idea. Okay, so you can take it or leave it for sure. Take it or leave it for sure. But really keep coming back to this heading of these are obstacles to energy. They're obstacles to energy. So if they're not obstacles to energy for you, maybe they're not these kinds of laziness. You know, it's really about looking at these and then marrying it up with your own life experience. Um, so I think that this middle one is the easiest to understand. The last one is, I think, the hardest to understand. This laziness of despondency or self-contempt or loss of heart. And I've asked Tibetan lamas, is this the same thing as depression? Right, when you hear about depression um, and then you look at this laziness of despondency, it sounds like you're talking about the same thing, but of course we would never say to a clinically depressed person, you're lazy, um, because that's not gonna help. And it might not even be true. Maybe put a pin in that, we'll come back to it. So this laziness of despondency, this is thinking spiritual practice is only for special people, not us, forgetting our Buddha potential and deciding to stay ordinary and not develop our path. It's a false humility. Yeah, it's a false modesty. Um, it's basically saying I'm nothing special and that gives me permission not to develop myself. If I think of myself as special, then I'm arrogant and full of pride and how dare I think perfection is possible. And I'm just going to really identify as little old me doing my little old life. And that's a humble, good way to be, which is nonsense because you have Buddha nature. So it's like letting yourself off the hook for practice out of a false sense of your smallness. Yeah. And the way it feels is like sadness or discouragement. Um, yeah, loss of heart, loss of heart. And it's often fed by, um, you know, it's often fed by thinking that you should be perfect already before you even start. Yeah. And then if you aren't, there's a problem. Um, my, my mom, you know, who I've talked about before, who is on the autism spectrum and who is a genius, she, she says this very profound thing to me, which is, is, of course, you know, from a famous philosopher, she says, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. Don't make the perfect the enemy of the good, which is, you know, not her quote, it's a philosopher's quote, but she says it all the time. And to me, it's very profound that she says it because she thinks perfection is possible given how um, fixed her mind can get with her autism spectrum thinking and how smart she is because she's a, 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 able to do many things very well. So this is like a huge breakthrough moment that she could say, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Meaning, just because you can't do it perfectly doesn't mean it's not worth doing, right? In fact, for it to be worth doing, it probably can't be perfect yet. Once it's perfect, you're done, right? Yeah, Iris? Yeah, um, I have nothing to say about it, but um, I'll apologize first because there is some criticism in it. <laughs> so take my apologies first, okay? I feel that specifically um, this uh, stream of Buddhism where you dedicate yourself to become Buddha nature, Buddha like, Bodhisattva, etc. actually uh, is in greater danger of that kind of thing. It's not, I don't have to be um, clinically depressed to say, well, that kind of enlightenment is really, I don't know, there are those 10 stages, etc., etc. I didn't even uh, scratch the first one. Okay. And having it elaborated so much about the very high, for me personally, kind of makes this a, a higher danger than just to think about. Like many times we talk about the Swiss scope, so I don't know how we, how we call it. The three kind of work. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, the three, yeah, the three scopes or the three capacities. Yeah. Right. And well, we mentioned the lower one, 
but we mention and then leave it aside because that's not where we aspire, you know. Uh, I feel that um, this, this way of building things up is like leading to that kind of uh, giving up, okay? Well, if you think about um, just practicing a little bit and be a little bit relieved, just that actually makes you want to practice more. It's very, very simple. It's nothing to, about saving the world. It's very simple and it's self-enhancing. The dangers you described is 100% the danger. That's you're exactly, you hit the nail on the head that you know, in striving for, for perfection, you see that you aren't gonna be able to do it anytime soon and then you feel crap about yourself and you don't wanna even start. But before you met all of this path, you were actually living a very meaningful, good life that you felt happy about. And then you're like, damn you spiritual path, making me think I'm not good enough. Now I'm depressed, before I was fine. You know, it can be a bit like that. And what we're saying with the three scopes is a really good example that you can be a great scope practitioner with a small scope ability, you know, a great scope aspiration, but a small scope person and not think of yourself as small. You see it as a process, right? And so it's, it's about very much about understanding the difference between pride and confidence, which is the next session, next section that we're going to get to soon, the connecting with contentment. But just to give you a little bit about it, Confidence gives you energy, pride steals your energy when it's confronted. If it's not confronted, pride gives you energy too, right? But the thing about pride is how fixed the identity is. And so pride has an idea of who you are that is actually you on your best day when everything's going smoothly. Yeah, so pride takes your best version when everything's going smoothly and says, this is who I am. And this is the level I can perform at. And this is the level of respect people should give me. And it's really holding that, which is kind of true sometimes, but you're holding that as an identity feature. And then when pride meets your inability to do something that you think you should already be able to do because you understand it intellectually and you've tried a few times, then your pride gets defeated and kind of like crumples and your identity crumples and everything just kind of falls in a heap of why bother? Why bother? It's never gonna work, why bother? I thought I was this, it turns out I'm not, therefore I'm nothing. And you go from the top to the bottom. Confidence can be completely aware of all of your deficiencies while at the same time knowing how you are on your best days when things are going well and know what your potential is if you keep training yourself. So your confidence identity is living in your potentiality. Your pride identity is living on what you've already achieved in isolation from all of your deficiencies, but it's like locked in, right? And then when it's challenged, you get defensive or you get defeated. Do you know this one, right? Whereas confidence knows you can change, you can develop, you've seen yourself do it, and you're not done yet, but that doesn't mean it's impossible, right? It gives you a set, like a marathon mentality. Yeah, step by step by step, I'll get there. Yeah, and I know that I can because I've come so far already. And so this small little life of mine, I can really think of as a small little life with a vast motivation. And that makes my small little life have greater impact on myself and others, even if nothing about the conditions change, even if I don't suddenly get famous or lots of people in my life or the respect or whatever, it doesn't matter. The life becomes bigger even if the conditions are small because you've shifted your, your identity to your potential not to what you've already achieved and who you already are. I, I don't know, does it, I mean, does it make sense in terms of freeing up energy and why it is we get a bit defeated? Because this is the big question in this laziness of despondency is what, what makes us feel defeated, deflated, disillusioned, fatigue? What creates that heaviness in us? Yeah, what, what, you know, and it, it can be that um, I tried and it didn't work. 
<laughs> right? Or I should be better than this by now. It's all these kind of thoughts that sound rational, but aren't holding a big enough picture in mind. And so the dangers that you were describing here are exactly the dangers. Those are the dangers, but those are not the teachings. Yeah, the teaching is not that. The teaching is saying, step by step by step, all of us will achieve perfection. Yeah. And what's more, in this very day, I can touch more happiness and I touch more altruism and open my heart greater if I actually relax into who I am rather than who I think I should be or who I am on my best day. Because right now, my current abilities are good enough to progress with. So it's like a contentment that's not complacent. Yeah? That you are like, what I have and who I am is enough to progress with. It's not like enough, I'm never gonna work anymore. It's like, it is enough, I'm already getting good work done. And that shows me that more progress is possible because it took a while to get this way. I mean, does it make more sense or does it bring up more kind of um, questions or resistance? I think about the household versus the, the monks. We live a very busy and, and uh, crazy life, usually not while we're in quarantine. Um, it's very hard in the end of the day, which was very busy with mostly uh, treating other people. Uh, continuing, I don't know, to read Buddhistic uh, books or papers or uh, meditating or, uh, I don't know. Like certainly it's whether it's a householder life or a monastic life you know that's not necessarily the issue for me um i think that uh you know venerable rubina says sometimes being a monk or a nun or being a householder isn't hard being a human being is hard right it's hard to be a human being and you know there are different ways that um just the busyness of life to us or inspire us it depends it depends, but I think it's completely valid to say, I am too busy to look at all the things I want to look at. And some of that busyness is out of my control at this point. It's, it's completely valid to say that for a second. Yeah. To so say, actually, I am too busy to look at all the things I want to look at right now. Some of those things are within my control, my ability to control and some aren't. Some are things that if I create more space or connect with the space in my mind better, I'll feel it free up. And some of it's just the way life is right now and I need to make peace with it. But everything is fuel for practice when you orient yourself with identity being with your potentiality. You don't have to feel like you're taking two steps forward and the three steps back or whatever. It's that everything comes into fuel for practice, whether it's busyness or whether it's peace. Yeah, because you have this confidence that everything can be filtered back in through your wisdom. Yeah, that you have wisdom and it's developing. Yeah, it is difficult when you're looking at a spiritual path that shows you that there is still work to be done. That, that is confronting, especially for someone who others would say is emotionally integrated and intellectually sound and has a career that's respectable and a family that's as it should be and you've ticked all the boxes of someone who should get respect and then you meet a path and you realize there's actually huge vast more you can do with your mind it can make you a little bit unsettled because you kind of feel like but i was doing so well <laughs> right or you know it was good enough how long is it going to take before I get the stamp of approval that my ego so seeks? You know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting thing to look at, but it shouldn't make us disheartened. It should make us excited that, oh, wait, I haven't achieved the pinnacle of emotional development and career aspirations. And in fact, that's not even the point. How wonderful there's more I can do with my life, because if this was it, I'm bored now. I don't know. It's just, it's one way to explore it. But I, I think this laziness of despondency 
it's, it's a really interesting one to explore because you can have great confidence and humility at the same time, right? And in fact, it's easier to be humble, I think, if you have confidence, because it's not the sad humility of I am bad, everyone's better. It's the confident humility that says, there are so many things I don't know, and I'm going to. But there are so many things I don't know, but it's got this real joy of, but I'm going to, <laughs> right? Because you have this confidence in your potential. This laziness of despondency says, there's so many things I don't know, and I'll never be able to know them, and why bother? Do you know what I mean? So it's, we have to be careful and I think we have to trust ourselves that when something feels like this isn't a healthy way to approach the spiritual path, that must mean that there's been something that we've either misunderstood about the teachings or there could be the case of the teachings not, be, not being presented in a way that is modern and applicable, but much more likely is that we've misunderstood. So don't feel like your um, intuition or your knee-jerk reaction, like what Iris was saying, don't think that that means you're wrong or that the Dharma is wrong. It means there's a very important place of investigation coming. It's a very important place. Yeah? It's really clear. And, you know, I'm someone who's tired all the time, basically, because, you know, health conditions and whatever. So it doesn't really matter if I get enough sleep or not, I'm going to be tired, right? And, you know, probably all of us are in the same boat, just with, you know, family life and aging and all these kind of things. It's, you know, it's hard to have a pocket of the day where you're like, I am 100% right now. Um, but there are things that we can do before we go to sleep that's going to make it a more effective sleep. Absolutely, 100%. Um, from a Buddhist perspective, the first thing you do before you get into the bed, right, but you're like near, you know, you're like walking over, is to do a, a purification practice. But if that's not your deal, that's not your thing, it's basically a day review, right? You just sort of, you can sit on the edge of your bed, you know, and just kind of like sit there in your jammies and think, all right, so this morning, how was this morning, then later, and you're just scanning through the day, and what can you celebrate and rejoice in and feel that was a good piece of work and what are the things where ah, I fell off track there and actually if I don't sit with it for a second it's going to eat me as I sleep yeah whether consciously or unconsciously if there's ways that I kind of went off track it's probably going to affect my ability to let go in the sleep process and feel rejuvenated although sometimes sleep can help integrate those things um, often when we've kind of done the wrong thing or whatever, that's what's going to eat us. And so if you can sit with, oh, I spoke too harshly to so-and-so. I really wish I hadn't spoken that way to them. Or, you know, I forgot to ring so-and-so and I promised to. If you can sit with actually the things that didn't, didn't go well in your day and make some plan and do some letting go process of remembering dependent arising, remember that while it's your responsibility, it's not your fault. Yeah, and it, you know, do some sort of just clearing through the day. You know, use the four opponent powers if you can, but even if that's not your thing, if you just kind of sit with rejoicing and regretting, then you're kind of tidying it up the day. And then you lay down, and if your last thoughts can be, may I be of benefit to all sentient things for all sentient beings, for all sentient beings, well, you know, fall asleep. Then when you wake up, usually your thought is, may I be of benefit to all sentient beings. If you go to sleep kind of um, distracted or worried about the day or having just watched something or having just listened to something that often kind of, you know, is like an earworm and it goes in and it has an effect on your sleep all the way through and you can wake up with um, the same thing you went to bed with and it's not helpful and it's actually kept you from completely rejuvenating during the sleep process.
Um, so if you can go to sleep with a good motivation, that's, that's really excellent. Yeah, a thought, a prayer, a poem, but connect with it before you fall asleep. It really helps. And, you know, um, then the basics that the, um, the monks do and the nuns do if you're in retreat and you have to wake up way earlier than you want to is um, you can do things like wash your feet right before bed, right? That can be really helpful. You can um, make sure that everything's the right temperature, but you're not too warm, but not too cold. And then, you know, sometimes just like life and health and body rebels and you're just going to wake up a million times during the night because of hormones or kidneys or whatever, and you're just going to keep waking up and that's just going to happen because physiologically that's what's happening with you. And then you just bring compassion to yourself and you can think how many other people are awake at 3 a.m. and have to go to the bathroom and wish they were warm in bed? Probably a lot. I'm with you, my family, <laughs> you know, and you can kind of connect with that right so those are just some some thoughts you know of stuff that we talk about but um sleeping too much can make you as tired as sleeping not enough but probably for you guys sleeping too much is not as much of a danger as it is for i don't know your teenage children yeah i think uh, as a western trying to be a better person but can't be a real buddhist i mean with all the verses and I can't become a nun, not yet because I didn't take this decision yet, but and I'm not joking, I'm saying it as it is. I think uh, one should find a way uh, to live skillfully, I would say, remember the impermanency, remember the dependence horizon, remember emptiness, remember everything, but I think uh, if you don't want to stay uh, with an inner conflict with your own self, with your life. So some things that, you know, regular people, most of the people are attached to, like eating, like uh, all these kind of uh, joyful uh, other activities that human beings are doing, you know, unless they renounce uh, these kind of activities or like, I don't know sexual activities, etc. I think uh, what is the middle way? What is the right way to, to live by the six perfections, to try to, to be aware of, but not being, you know, one might find himself all the time saying, oh, I'm a lazy, I'm a lazy, I'm, I'm nothing, I'm no good. I'm, and there is a danger if you want to become like inspired by Buddhism that often you are blaming yourself for not being good enough actually. So you're living under this inner uh, attack of not being good enough while you do want to be good enough, at least this, you know, in a deeper, in a deeper sense. So I think when we study this stuff, we have to remember that uh, not to not to turn it to be a persecuting thing because you're not living as a nun or you know, or something like this you know it's inspired by this it's it might uh, bring you into a inner conflict but vivid one and that persecuting you yeah yeah it can and i mean you know, again, it's never, it's never the life or the lifestyle or the behaviors that we're really addressing, and except for the behaviors of the 10 non-virtues, which are harmful, right? We're, we're talking about, you know, things that minimize that which distracts us from what we've decided is important. So you're, you know, you can be just as an effective um, practitioner as a lay person as you can be as a nun, exactly the same amount of effectiveness and benefit or a lay person can be far more beneficial than a monk or a nun. It's not about the vows. It's not about the decisions of that type in and of themselves. It's that you see where you are and you ask yourself, what distractions can I manage to separate myself from given who I am so far, right? 
And if I try and force myself to give up more than I, I'm able to, there'll be a backlash and a rebellion and I'll become worse than I started or I'll become depressed that I can't, right? That's what happens. You have an inner rebellion and you say, it's not possible because I can't do it. Therefore, it's not possible for me or it's not possible for anyone. And everyone's a hypocrite who says that they're any different, and rah, rah, rah. Or I can't do it. Therefore, I'm bad and deficient and everyone is better than me. And it becomes this whole trip. And what the path is about really, and this laziness stuff is about looking at how do I pace? It's all about pacing. Because if you can get pacing under control, life is rosy, whether you're a monk or a nun or a lay person or whatever, you know, and identifying as a Buddhist doesn't mean you're identifying as a Buddha, right? If you had to be perfect before you began, there would be no point. The whole point in Buddhism is saying, and take refuge in your own ability to develop and transform. Your mind has the capability for perfection, and that is you. Everything else is extra and incidental. And whatever behaviors that take you away from your path, they're not going to always. And some of them help for now, and you'll gradually let them go. You know, it's a bit like for a while, small children need to like suck on their thumbs. And then just gradually they stop needing it. And some kids need more support for stopping that than others. But it's not like they're bad for needing to later than it makes sense. But if you try and like force them to stop sucking their thumb before they're ready, there's going to be a backlash and they might do it even longer. You know, so it's the same for us. It's like, you know, I know this for myself, my first year of ordination when I was a nun for one year, that first year of being a nun was just like, be good, be good, be good. Everything you can be to be good. Help them with this, help them with that. Study very hard, meditate all the time. And it was much more than I was capable of but I was capable of it for a little bit, right? And because I pushed myself beyond my pacing ability, then there was a huge backlash and my second year and my third year were chaos until I found some sort of equilibrium. So, you know, it was like in those two, that year two and year three of chaos, I was worse than I was when I was a lay person in terms of my practice, in terms of my mind, in terms of my level of happiness, in terms of my level of effectiveness in my community. I was just a chaotic mess because I pushed too hard, too fast, had a backlash, and basically went between depression and rebellion, depression and rebellion for like two years. So, it, you know, this can happen to us if we misunderstand the teachings and misunderstand that everything is posed in terms of pacing. And the three scopes are framed in terms of pacing. First, assess where you are, then assess where you want to be, then decide how to practice today. And any kind of practice is something worth celebrating because we have eons, beginningless time, habits of being self-centered, of being egocentric, of misapprehension of self, et cetera, et cetera. We have so many eons of habit of the false way of viewing things and the wrong way to act in terms of harming ourselves and others. If we do anything that's positive, it's worth celebrating. But when you meet Buddhist ideas, you know, it's so easy to take it too much to heart in the wrong way. Like I'm so bad that I didn't know this and I'm so bad that I can't do it yet. And why is it taking so long and what's wrong with me or what's wrong with it? It's so natural that when we meet this path, this is our impression. But, you know, people that are heritage Buddhists, you know, like Tibetan people and people from Bhutan and Mongolia, they don't have so much pressure on themselves because they've lived a whole life of seeing, you just do what you can given the conditions you have. You just do what you can. And they're such kind people and they're so relaxed. Of course, it's a huge, broad generalization, right? You know, but generally speaking, you, you find more percentage of, you know, people that are heritage Buddhists able to connect with the relaxation and the joy of the spiritual path. Or people that um, didn't grow up with Buddhism, you know, we put so much pressure on ourselves. They don't do that. That's not like the natural way to practice what we do. We're harsh, I don't know. Yeah. Let, let me remind us that uh, we are, we're standing on the difference, on the radical difference between the super ego 
and the idealized pole of the self. And I think that many of the remarks and comments that have been heard as this session was, were related to the super ego uh, notion of understanding the, the, the inner struggle or the existential struggle within us. So when, whenever we are relying on this understanding of a super ego, then we are coming despondency is uh, related to being bad or not worthy and all kinds of these things. But if we are relying on, on the principle of the idealized part of the self, it's, not, it's nothing about being bad or being not sufficient or not, uh, uh, not fully uh, completing uh, my job. It's only understanding what's before me. For example, whenever I'm meeting one of my teachers or other spiritual teachers, and I know about the, about the uh, gap between me and them, it never caused me any, any dependency, any dependency uh, reaction. I'm so glad, I'm so grateful that someone else is fulfilling what is potential to any one of us. Even if I, in my condition, I'm not able to this uh, uh, space or to this uh, spacious uh, things that our spiritual teachers are able to. But I think that if you, re if you come again and again and again uh, to the theoretical foundation of our, uh, of our understanding of the mind, then the question of being uh, Equalizing dependency as something bad is not is not at all uh, so cruel on, on us. We can see the energy and the economy of energy where I am putting, where I am investing my energy. That's all 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 things that is on on the on the Muslim, on the. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like the, the key, one of the key parts of what you said is, you know, where do I invest my energy? Because it's right in that is built in, I only have a certain amount of energy right now. And as I develop, I'll have more, just like when you practice something, it takes less effort to do it. But you know, you think of your current ability and your current amount of energy, it's, it's a limited amount for now. And so how can we use it in a way that is the most efficient for doing what we've decided is meaningful. Not because if we don't, we're bad, because if we don't, we're less efficient and we'll run out of gas. You know, that's why we'll run out of gas and then we won't have any gas left to do the part of the trip we want to do. Yeah, not about bad or good. And so it's, it's realizing that if you maximize energy or you maximize fuel, that you're going to achieve the things that make you happy and enriched and effective. You know, and so you're, you're noticing what are the energy stealers, you know, it's like if you were looking at the electricity box in your house and noticing that the refrigerator took a lot more energy than you realized and maybe you need a new refrigerator that it's more energy efficient and that's why your power bill has been so high. It's similar, you're looking at these obstacles to energy and going, actually, I give myself permission to avoid a lot of things and that very avoidance is costing me energy why don't I just decide why is it that I've been putting it off and see if there's something I need to address and then move on, right? Or what if I look at the way that I've approached humility and modesty and realize that it's a false humility and modesty, that I've let myself feel low or look down on myself as if it was a spiritual quality when in fact I need the humility that comes from confidence that knows isn't it wonderful there's so much more I can do? Isn't it wonderful there's so much more I can learn? And so I identify as a seeker or I identify as a learner or I identify as someone on a spiritual path, not because I'm good at a spiritual path, right? It doesn't mean you have to be any good at it whatsoever. It just means you like it and you want it and you're on it, yeah? You know, and then have a beer, I don't know, do what you want, it's none of my business. Right? <laughs> right? We all do things that are not in alignment with our priorities. We're all hypocrites, all of us. You know, there's all ways that we have cognitive dissonance. That's not the problem, right? The problem is feeling that that shouldn't be the case for us to identify as a spiritual practitioner. 
you know, I mean, our own hypocrisy, I think is just fuel for humor, if anything, all right? You think I am a ridiculous creature, that this is my, this is my priority and yet I'm doing this. That is ridiculous and funny. Aren't we funny? And that makes us feel connected to everyone else who's full of hypocrisy. If you don't have this deep kind of confidence in yourself, then you see your own hypocrisy and it makes you defensive and fearful or whatever, right? It does all sorts of things. Um, but this really deep confidence of, I will be a Buddha, Buddhahood is possible. Even if you don't have that, if you have a higher level of happiness and effectiveness is possible for me. Whatever I call it, a higher level of happiness and effectiveness is possible for me because I'm developing all the time. Because I've already decided the purpose of my life is altruism and that is a rare and precious thing to decide. It seems only natural because we're so used to it. And then you just look around the world and you realize not everyone is oriented that way and it's a problem. How wonderful that it occurred to us to care about others, that it even occurred to us. So many conditions had to come together for it to even occur to us to try and be of benefit. You know, and so we don't use that as a ego thing or a pride thing. We see it as how fortunate it all came together for me to wake up even a smidge, you know, even a little bit. So um, sit with it. Um, you don't have to swallow it. Just sit with it. And um, if you want to start reading His Holiness a little bit, um, that would be great. And I'll see you Wednesday. So just take a minute and reconnect. Digest. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.